purpose of this video is to give you a brief history on relief printing and block printing and to offer a tutorial and demonstrations at the end of the video. So you'll be able to do a version of uh, your own blocks yourself. The idea is you're not expected to create blocks or prints using the same tools or the same materials that uh, were historically used. The idea is to get the experience of what it's like to create block prints. We don't normally associate printing with the ancient world, but in fact it's prehistoric. Cave paintings were the first place we saw prints being used on cave walls where our ancestors would replicate their own hands in a pattern that was pleasing to them for uh, religious purposes probably, but it was the very first type of printing that ever was done. The Chinese invented printing in relief. They carved their blocks from one piece of wood in reverse and printed them with ink. Over the centuries, printing in the Orient became highly sophisticated. The Japanese developed refined methods of printing that emulated continuous tone printing that we're familiar with today. Woodcuts came to the West via the Silk Road in the early Middle Ages. These early European woodcuts had a certain naivete to them, and yet you can see in them the refinements that would later lead to more detailed printmaking techniques. Here you can see a woodcut artist working. It's from the Tudor period by his dress. And also note that he's working with knives on his table. That was primarily the tool that the medieval cutters used for making their cuts. The principle of relief printing works in that the ink is placed on the raised surface of the wood. So anything you don't want to print, you cut away. And what's left behind takes the ink and can be printed onto the paper. The thing to remember, of course, is that anything you cut on the wood will be printed in reverse, which is particularly important when you're doing letters, characters, or anything that would look strange uh, if printed backwards. With the dawn of the Renaissance, master woodcut artists like Albrecht Dürer were able to create masterpieces in print just using a knife, cutting on a plank of wood. Wood cutting is still used in the graphic arts and is a major component of most art school programs. Here you can see a student cutting on a very, very large uh, wood cut, uh, basically a 4x8 sheet of plywood. Proving the adage that art students get to use all the fun tools, here is one using a pavement roller to take the print with what must have been rather satisfying results. Any Tools that cut wood are suitable to work with on the wood plank. These are chisels and gouges that many artists use to uh, create their woodcuts. Etching as a form of printing emerged around 1500 in Europe. Even ancient times, armor was commonly etched on as a decorative process. Etching on metal offered the opportunity to print highly detailed lines and marks. These are also referred to as intaglio prints. Etching works on the reverse principle of uh, relief printing. There is a relief, but the relief isn't inked. The ink is spread over the entire plate after the marks are made on it. Then the ink is wiped from the surface of the plate, leaving it in all, leaving the ink residue in scratches and grooves that are, that are left behind. It takes a great deal of pressure to get a print from an intaglio plate. So dampened paper is used, laid down on the plate, then run through an etching press. And when it's pulled off, the ink, the paper is pressed into the ink on the plate. And then the paper is pulled off and you can see the print re result. This is an etching press. You can tell that because of the long arms, it requires a great deal of leverage because it is placing tremendous pressure on the plate that's going through the, 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 the cylinders. Etching in this way added a certain artistry to printing because the artist was able to sometimes leave residues of ink on the surface of the plate in areas that weren't cut, uh, giving it a kind of a mood that you could not create in other forms of printmaking. This is an intaglio print by the Dutch old master Rembrandt.
William Blake was arguably the very first private press printer. He created his own intaglio plates and either hand colored them or colored the plates themselves prior to printing. There's a lot that's not known about exactly how he created some of his prints. He often engraved the text along with the illustration on the same plate. This is an etching of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which shows a great deal of nuance and tonal range. And this is an etching of his daughter, Sarah Coleridge, and finally an etching of her daughter, Edith Coleridge. You can see how the nuances and detail of the prints strives to recreate the continuous tone of a pencil sketch with great success. The etchings by Gustave Doré in Coleridge's Rime of the Ancient Mariner, the edition of 1875, have become iconic. The problem with plates engraved on steel or copper was that you couldn't get very many impressions from them. Passing them through a press under intense pressure caused them to wear out rather quickly. This meant edition runs were quite small and required the plate to be remade or recast if, if it was a long run. Fortunately, in the late 18th century, an engraver named Thomas Buick decided to try out his metal engraving tools on the end grain of English boxwood. Using the more traditional relief prints that we're familiar with from woodcuts, he was able to recreate and recapture the detail of etching in a much faster, much cheaper method. As well, the blocks of wood proved to last for thousands of prints, unlike the metal ones, which wore out after several hundred impressions. This revolutionized illustration in magazines and books. From the 18th century, where there were hardly any illustrations in newspapers and magazines, to the 19th century, where entire covers could be created to illustrate a magazine. This made illustrated news magazines very popular in the 19th century. In this scenario, an artist would do a drawing, which the newspaper would cut up into sections and hand out to several different engravers who work in tandem to create the entire page. They just leave a tiny edge of the block uncut. When all the blocks come together, at the newspaper again, the master engraver would finish the edges of the engravings and join everything up. Commercial wood engraving faded in the late 19th century, but it continued to be used as a way for artists to express themselves and illustrate books well into the 20th century. Here we have a spread from the Kelmscott Chaucer produced by William Morris. Everything except the type is wood engraved. The illustrations based on designs by Edward Byrne Jones and the border and drop caps designed by William Morris. Here is a composite of photos showing the progression of a wood engraving. This is a, a drop cap O from a fairy tale. You can see how the darkened block is being carved away, revealing the light wood leaving just what is left to print. In the early 20th century, artists discovered that linoleum, the flooring material, was ideal for making block cuts that emulated wood cuts. Made from a mixture of ground cork, resin, and linseed oil, linoleum was plentiful and cheap, and could be mounted up on a board to bring it to type high to be used on any kind of letterpress. You could cut lino with pretty much anything sharp, particularly a knife, but gouges work beautifully. Being softer than wood, it is easier to cut lino, and there is no grain to fight against. Here is a side-by-side -side representation of an, a lino cut. On the left, we have the cut lino that's been on the press and already printed, and on the right, we have the resulting print. It should become apparent that anything you can cut into that's flat could make a good print. Rubber stamps make use of soft rubber to produce a print, and the same can be done with an eraser, for example, or even a potato, which has the consistency and firmness to be able to produce a rudimentary print. Which brings us back to the beginning, where the only form we had was what our body could provide us.